In this video I'll be laying a patio in our garden which I'll later be building a pergola over the top of. But first just a quick recap about how we got to this point. First we demolished a lean-to conservatory on the back of our house. That was covered in a video which I'll leave a link to in the description. Then I needed to demolish the concrete slab underneath the conservatory, uncover the concrete foundations and excavate lots of soil to get enough depth to lay a sub base for the patio. And with that done the ground level was about 150mm lower than the surrounding paving slabs and I needed to add about 50 to 60mm of hardcore and I could reuse some of the smaller bits of concrete rubble for some of that. And all of that work was also covered in a video which again I'll leave a link to below. And that brings us up to date. Next I needed to order some building materials so I ordered some paving slabs from a landscaping chap on Facebook Marketplace who kindly delivered them to me. These are 450mm square slabs with a riven surface so they have a bit of texture to them rather than being smooth and I'll be honest we mainly chose these because they were cheap and I'll cover the costs of this work later in the video. We weren't really fussy about what the slabs looked like, we just wanted them to be different to the surrounding slabs to make a bit of a feature of the new space that we're creating. I also ordered a ton of MOT Type 1 hardcore to finish the sub base as A I didn't have quite enough of the concrete rubble to get the depth of sub base we needed and B the MOT Type 1 stuff varies in size from small particles right up to larger bits and that makes for an ideal sub base that can be compacted into a really solid foundation for the patio rather than the concrete rubble which was mainly larger bits. Plus a ton of sharp sand and 8 bags of cement and usually I'd have wanted to shop locally for this stuff but unfortunately the delivery fees from local suppliers were ridiculous and also they deliver it loose, in other words they just tip it into the garden which would have been a bit of a logistical nightmare because we wouldn't have been able to get the car in and out of the drive so I ended up buying from one of the big builders merchants who I have a trade account with so I got a bit of a discount, free delivery plus they deliver it bagged for convenience and they crane it in which is not only fun to watch but also it meant that we could store it in this small area in the corner of our garden so that it wouldn't be in the way. Before I add the extra hardcore first I want to mount these post holders to the original concrete foundation. I can use some of these glazing packers to get it sitting nice and level and I marked the location of the holes and then drilled 6mm holes into the concrete with an SDS drill. And then I drove in some 100mm concrete screws, no need to use roll plugs here as these screws bite into the concrete and give a nice solid fixing. You'll see though that I only managed to get three of the four corners secured but that doesn't matter as this is all going to get mortared in later anyway so it's not going anywhere. Here I'm just double checking that it's fitted square to the wall by measuring from each side and it looked perfect. Then I can figure out the placement of the next holder in relation to the first and this is all based off a drawing I'd already done for the pergola that I'm going to be building but I'll talk more about that in the future pergola video. And the concrete was really rough where I wanted to put this one so I used a diamond blade in my grinder to get it as flat as possible and again a few shims here and there just to get it sitting level. So next I can get all of the hardcore moved around to the back of the house, one barrow at a time and I used a lot more than I expected to actually, I ended up using almost the whole ton. I used a rake to spread it out evenly and next I needed to compact the sub base down and for that I borrowed this petrol powered whacker plate from my cousin who runs a landscaping business. First I sprayed a bit of water over it all just to keep the dust down and I'd never used one of these before and they're not exactly straightforward to turn on. There's an on button, a fuel lever, a choke lever and a throttle to contend with and it all needs to be done in the right order too. I think it was on, fuel, choke, start, choke, throttle, something like that anyway. So here I'm just getting a feel for it and then I did a kind of spiral from the outside working my way into the center and I went over this twice just to make sure it was really solid. This video is sponsored by Tradeify, an all-in-one job management application for both desktop and mobile devices. It's designed especially for tradespeople to take a lot of the time and hassle away from doing admin and to get paid faster. You can set up automated invoicing and quotes, manage timesheets and time recording, job scheduling, incoming inquiries, plot job locations on a map, financial and productivity reporting and more. You'll find a link in the description box to the website where you can get a free 14-day trial and if you use the code RAGON and bone you'll get 50% off the first three months membership after the 14 day trial expires. So the ground is now really nicely compacted. I wasn't able to do the area surrounding the posts 
um, because obviously I couldn't get the wacker plate in there, but I don't think that's going to be an issue because obviously the concrete foundation runs around the perimeter. I want to talk about these post holders and when I bought these, I hadn't realized that they had these metal tabs on the inside sticking out. And these are designed to cut into the timber. So you basically hammer the timber in and these lock the timber in place. I don't like that because obviously the timber that I'm using is pressure treated and these tabs are going to cut into the timber and compromise that treatment because the treatment only penetrates the wood around 10 millimeters. I really don't need these tabs because the post fits tightly inside the holder anyway. The holder is secured down to concrete and this is all going to get mortared in with slabs on top so it's not going to go anywhere. So I'm actually going to have a go at just cutting these tabs away with the multi-tool. I fitted one of these Milwaukee metal cutting blades in the multi-tool and these cut really well. The tabs came off in no time actually. I know what you're probably thinking, why didn't I cut these off before fitting the post holders? And you're absolutely right, I definitely should have done that. But this didn't take too long at all, and as the multi-tool is compact, it meant I could reach right inside the post holders, even to get the ones at the very bottom. It didn't leave the smoothest surface though, so I used my electric belt file just to grind away any sharp bits. And then just to protect the metal from rusting, I gave it a few coats of black spray paint. Before I start laying slabs, I thought it'd be useful to have a string line to reference from for the height of the existing slabs. I had a couple of bits of threaded rod and a bit of string, so that's what I used. The very first slab is going to need a cutout in the corner to fit around the post holder, so here I'm marking that up, and with this measurement I also need to account for a 10 to 12 millimeter gap between the old slabs and the new. A larger cutter or grinder would have been the ideal tool to use for this, but I don't have one, so I'm making do with what I have, which means I'm going to need to make the cut from both sides of the slab in order to get all of the way through. This didn't leave the cleanest cut, but I could still get in there with the grinder to clean it up. I was also able to borrow a cement mixer so I can start mixing up the mortar, and I'm doing four parts sharp sand to one part cement. Mixing in a bit of plasticizer would have been a really good idea, and I had some in the shed too, but I completely forgot to use it. The plasticizer would have made the mortar more fluid and easier to work with. And then I can just add water until it's a good consistency. And this first mix I mixed up too dry, although I didn't know that at this point. I was going for a dry mix because it's a stronger mix, but when I offered up my slab and started trying to level it with my rubber mallet, I realized that the mix wasn't really loose enough and that meant that I needed to hit it quite hard and that caused my first slab to break. Again, I think plasticizer would have helped here, but I'm an idiot and I didn't use it. So I was off to a bad start and I cut another slab and this time I was able to get it level with both the spirit level and the old slabs. And when I say level, it's level in one direction, but there's a slight runoff leaning away from the house to allow water to drain away. The second slab went down okay, but from this point on I mixed up my mortar with more water so that it was a bit looser, and you can probably see that in this footage here. It's a lot easier to work with, but it still holds its shape really well. When I got to the second post I could measure up for the next cut, The final slab on this first run needed to be cut down too, just a straight cut this time, so that it could slot in next to the old slabs. I found it useful to use a long spirit level to check not only for level, but also flatness. So at this point I've kind of got into the rhythm of things and I've got the hang of what I'm doing. Obviously though this isn't the sort of work that I normally do. So I've reached a point where I just need to lay a final row of slabs and there's actually enough space here to actually get a full slab in without making any cuts. And I think that option would look the best but it's not the option I'm going to take. The roof of my pergola is going to finish about here which means from this point onwards this is all going to be exposed to the weather. And if there's a full slab here rain is going to hit that slab, splash back onto the wall above the damp proof course, and that could create damp issues with the wall. And the recommendation is that the ground level needs to be 150 millimeters below the damp proof course, which is here. Another option would be to cut the slabs so that they finish flush with the old slabs, 
but that means that the slices of slab are going to be quite thin and I don't really like that option either. So what I think I'm going to do is cut the slabs exactly in half and I'll finish the remaining space with some gravel just to help with drainage. I've got a few bags of cement left but I've completely run out of sand now so I need to go and buy some. I got some of this 10mm gravel to fill the void. I would have preferred the larger 20mm gravel to match the existing, but there was none available, so this will have to do. Next I could start pointing. No, pointing the slabs I mean. I bought one of these 8mm pointing tools from Amazon. I'll link to this down below, it worked pretty well. For this I mixed three parts sand to one part cement and added a little water to get quite a dry mix. This mix needs to hold together when you squeeze it, but you don't want it to be too wet because then it can stain the slabs. And this was actually the part of the whole project that I enjoyed the most. But then again, I quite like monotonous jobs. To be honest, I didn't enjoy laying the slabs at all and it's the sort of job that I would have preferred to just pay someone to do. But I did learn a lot and I'm quite pleased that I did it myself. And finally I can get the wall painted to blend in with the rest of the house. This project took me between 18 and 19 hours to complete. I'm sure a professional could do it much quicker than that, but I was kind of learning as I went along. My main mistakes on this project were, one, not using the plasticizer that I have a big five litre bottle of in the shed in the mortar. I think that would have made laying the slabs much easier. And two, one of the later pointing mixes that I mixed up was a little bit too wet, so I got a small amount of staining around the edge of the slabs. So I washed it off as best I could just with a wet sponge, and I'm hoping it won't show up once I leave it for a few days, and then I'm going to give it all a good pressure wash just to clean it up. There may be some more mistakes that I don't yet know about, which I'm sure the more experienced among my viewers will tell me about down below in the comments section. Is it perfect? No. Is it perfectly level? No, the riven textured surface of the slabs makes it quite difficult to get it spot on. Also, I feel like it would have been easier to lay a patio without trying to tie it in with old slabs that were laid many, many years ago, as that was another complication that meant I couldn't just rely on my spirit levels. Is it more level when you compare it with the surrounding old slabs? Yes, and most importantly, is it good enough for what we need it for? Yes, water is draining away from the house really nicely when it rains and when you walk over it, it feels good and solid and there are no trip hazards. So it's going to do the job just fine. Earlier in the video, I said I'd cover the costs in this video, but A, I haven't yet worked them all out and B, this video is already quite long. So I'm going to put out another video with all of that information in so that I can go into a bit more detail and break it down properly. Please subscribe to the channel if you'd like to help support the channel, plus get early access to my videos, exclusive content like the ones on screen now, free project plans and cut lists and a name credit at the end of my videos. You can check out my Patreon page or YouTube channel membership option in the description box below. Thank you for watching.